Hey guys, welcome back to the PC Perspective Podcast. This is episode 552, being recorded on August 1st, 2019. I'm Sebastian Peak. I'm Jeremy Hellstrom. I'm Josh Walrath. Uh, did you have a burger today, Josh, or was that yesterday? No, it was yesterday, only Wednesdays. Uh, see, yeah. I don't know, double A's Podcast day today. is burger day, so if we change the podcast day, you've got to eat a burger again. No, I don't. That's no. Okay, no, you didn't I have had a burger, a burger yesterday. for him. Uh, well, Josh, we need to talk what? about this. You didn't actually what? have a burger yesterday. I follow I you on Twitter. Have a burger. You did not have a burger. You had a sloppy Joe. It was a Joe. sloppy Joe. Okay. That's sorry. not a burger. Sloppy Joe well, is my birthday, is for so, children. you know, I uh, could have whatever I want. Call it what I want. Oh, happy yeah, birthday, birthday, Josh. Birthday. I'm sorry. Nobody sorry for yelling at you. Is that a sexist sandwich nowadays? Terrible. Sloppy Joe? Sloppy Joe? No. Well, Joe Not can yet. be a woman's name. Think about uh, thank you, uh, Little Women. Joe was one of the main characters in that. Louise I was thinking Jolene, classic. but still. Okay. You know, let me ask you guys this. Something mm-hmm. we, we talked about a little bit on Twitter is uh, d- when's the last time you've seen an R Gang rerun? You know, the Little Rascals. Not the 1994 I... crappy movie. Oh, God, no. No. But Little Rascals or R Gang. Yeah, I know. Our game, our like, game was first, right? Well, yeah, that was like the twenties, the forties, nineteen twenty-two to forty-four. Yeah, I, I was, I was looking at some yeah. gifs, uh, gifs, whatever you want to call them, and yeah, I, I GIF was is like, butter. okay, okay, that uh, I, I can understand why they are, why they are not on anymore. <laughs> no. They're a little, a little edgy. Okay, not exactly we, politically correct anymore. Mm-hmm. No. Uh, okay. Ote, indeed. And uh, mm-hmm. I could go into the whole spiel about the mailing list, and uh, you can join that, find out when we're going to go live, if we go live for this or any other reason. But uh, let's get right into it, because we've got... Every time I think it's a quiet week, because I-, I was wrapping up projects, or there are some weeks where I think it's there's a ton going on, and there's like no real interesting news stories. This, I thought, was pretty much a dead week, and I was trying to get the list down to 10 stories, and there's a lot going on driver updates and hardware ids and a bunch of other stuff but there were also a couple reviews up on the site this week Uh, i posted reviews of two cases that have a lot in common and i don't know what everybody's feeling is about tempered glass around here i know jeremy is probably hot well yeah but i mean the the biggest fan on staff is probably jeremy of uh, rgb everything i know how you feel about that so clearly you'd want that's no pun intended. I Clearly, like you to would want more glass. myself. I, yeah, my see? components. Sorry. Is it worth showing off what's inside your build? Is is it worth trading good thermals? And it seems like what more and more seeing, cases, like three to five degrees Celsius, easily. Uh, I think in some cases it's like ten. But we're talking yeah. about the first one on the list is the NZXT H510 Elite. This is a mid tower. They have a much larger uh, in the H series, which is the 700 series, which is up to the 710i. And this is the 510. So it's kind of their compact mid tower, they call it. It still takes full size ATX boards. It has a decent amount of room inside, kind of your typical modern case where there's no optical base, there's not a whole lot of storage support. Fractal Design is one of the few companies that still thinks you need to put like six hard drive bays in a case. Uh, NZXT is in the camp of two to three hard drives, a couple SSDs is enough, especially in a smaller case like this. So that's the first caveat is you you don't pick this one if you've got 10 hard drives. You pick this one because you're content with a minimal amount of storage and you like the way it looks. And we're looking uh, at the back uh, side panel of this case. You can see a strip that's less than two inches wide that's perforated. That is the only air intake for the front. The other side is solid glass. The front is solid glass and there's no air gap. So the only way this thing takes in air is through this little panel. And they, at least they put an air filter there. There's a little air filter strip on the inside of the case, but that's, it's more secure. There's not even an air gap. (laughs) Yeah. I I've complained about small air gaps before where there's like a half inch between the glass and the front fans, but there is no gap here. So I was very curious to see how much air you could really pull. I measured the space between the the front edge of the front intake fans and the glass, and it was one and a quarter inches. So there's not a lot of space in there. 
And however, I will say this thing shipped with three fans. I have it from NZXT that in the future, this case is being outfitted with four fans from the factory. They're going to populate that top fan mount with another exhaust fan, which will help. But the thermals were not terrible. I mean, I I did some thermal testing in this using the GPU test bed. I just threw that in there and I threw in an RTX 2070. It's an overclocked card from Asus, one of those Strix cards. And it was fine. Like you were running well within thermal limits. It's just... I guess there's two arguments. One, do you really need to run at 60 degrees at load or is 70 degrees at load just fine? Like it, it's, it's not like I had any throttling issues even running very long benchmarks. Like I did the full uh, X264 benchmark where it does four two pass runs and it takes forever. And I came back down here and checked it out and the highest recorded temp was still well below like thermal thresholds. So it's, it's fine. It's just not great. And it would be a lot better if that front panel was open or if it wasn't using tempered glass all around it. So the the trade-off though, unfortunately, I don't know if you noticed that as we look at these little charts here, it's pretty loud under load for a case like this because those fans, there's a, a smart controller built into this thing that all the fans are kind of run through and you can adjust different profiles with their cam software. And if you have it in the performance mode, it was 44 plus decibels under just a normal CPU load. It ramps up fast. It goes from 30, 35 decibels at idle to 45 pretty quickly. So they, they're they being aggressive to keep those temps down, and it's certainly at the cost of noise output. So I don't know if that's really worth it. I think there's there's been some signs from the community of some fatigue maybe with tempered glass cases i don't know how you guys feel or what you're hearing is airflow bad is airflow sexy again okay i could i could rectify that problem uh josh i could send you about five tempered glass cases and you could build a new wall in your office no no about 10 it does make good insulation clearly yeah what is the the r factor of the case yeah i recommend it uh, I've been doing this for years. My attic is lined with cases, and I'm actually not joking about that. Uh, let's move on to another tempered glass case. This one, Silverstone, I saw this. It was two CESs ago where they first had this on display. And they sometimes show stuff early while they're still working on it. They hadn't really finalized it yet. They sent this to me last year, like almost a year ago. I apologize to them profusely for taking so long to get to it. But this is pretty much all glass. The last case... I mean, amateur hour. You have glass on one side in the front. No, this is full-length glass panels, top to bottom, on three sides, only bordered by a chrome metal strip. That's that's your only break from the glass. The top is metal, the back is metal, everything else is glass. Well, I guess the bottom is also metal, but... Uh, what so, kind of form factor is that? That is micro ATX... No, oh. you know that ultra pow- uh, pop- popular form factor that everybody loves. No. Everybody produces motherboards yeah. for. Yeah. Well, a lot of people love it, but hard to get a motherboard for it. Right. So anyway, I mean, I, I used a mini ITX board for this because I actually don't have a modern micro ITX board. The only one I could find that I had on hand was an AM3 board, and I didn't have. I wasn't even going to go down that road. So limited. Storage, kind of the same story as that NZXT case. This one has three hard drive trays, and it has a couple SSD mounts on this little removable panel behind the motherboard tray. They don't ship this with any fans, so they strongly recommend that you grab fans for it. I put in a couple of Be Quiet fans on the front for some intake. It does have a gap around the front panel, so it can take in some air, but not a lot because it's solid glass up there. So I wasn't expecting much as far as the thermals go, but I will say this particular group of components, and because I wasn't using loud case fans, noise output was very low. Uh, Temps were higher than that NZXT case, but noise output was lower because I was just dealing with very quiet case fans and then however loud my components are. And 36.6 decibels was the highest uh, load And that was just the CPU cooler spinning up. It's a 92 millimeter fan, so it's kind of loud. Which is why I've been using it for case testing, because you can actually hear it. 
So I don't know. It's it's kind of the extreme version of the tempered glass look, but the tempered glass on this is really, really darkly tinted. So you can barely make anything out inside the case. How uh, how, much, how how much does it uh, fingerprint smudge? So uh, easily. Terrible? Oh yeah. 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 Both what the is the chrome... shipping box? Like on no, that norm, thing. normal normal shipping box. Really? I was kind of wow. surprised because they most cases arrive just in their retail packaging. There'll just be a case on the front step in its retail box. And I'm always worried. I've had a couple cases arrive smashed. But this one, even though it's tempered glass everywhere and in standard styrofoam inside of a regular size box, was perfectly fine. So the UPS gods were kind to this one. But yeah, that's logistically there are some issues. The best packaging I've ever seen from a case was probably a tie between Inwin and Corsair. Corsair goes all out with extra padding for some of their Crystal Series cases, especially like the 570X was in a almost a crate-like box. But I digress mm. into case packaging. So on to the next. Josh, you, you like process Me? technology, right? CPUs, you're kind of into that stuff. Uh, I, I can be. Well, I need you to be because okay. Intel now back in May, throw your mind back to May 28. I think it was. And Intel launches the new ice Lake 10 nanometer CPUs. Mm-hmm. Now back to present day, August 1st, 2019 Intel launches 10 nanometer ice Lake CPUs for real mm-hmm. this time. No mm-hmm. more kidding around this, this time mm-hmm. it's going to stick. So what they've mm-hmm. done is officially launched Though they're not shipping yet. But we do have specifications. We have the SKUs. We have a decoder for how to read the SKUs, uh, the new numbering system. And we have specs. So we we know there's going to be 11 different models that have been announced so far. I guess there's more coming at the end of this month. And I, I would implore you to take a look at those base frequencies and... I mean, does this not look like we've kind of gone back in time? Back, I mean, the Y series, I kind of expect low base clocks, but look at some of these new mainstream like Core i5 processors that are one gigahertz base frequency. There's some that are down to 700 megahertz in the Y series. And of course, mm-hmm. they have much higher max single and all core turbos, but there there is not a big leap in clock speed by any means these are low clocks so do you think and i know we have some early numbers from some of the the media who went out and were testing on site with the development platform but do you think that they've made sufficient strides in ipc to lower clocks this much is this just a function of them going to 10 nanometer and it not being mature enough to clock any higher than this uh, unknown at this time. I mean, my first guess is that um, all the clanking in the background means that there's work being done. <laughs> so I apologize for that. Um, and you know what? When you, you got to take it when you can, when you can get it. But anyway, uh, I think it may hmm. be a little bit of both. Uh, I mean, they they did uh, supposedly say. I mean, they increased IPC by eighteen percent, but it seems like. They've had to take a cut in clock speed to be able to hit the thermal envelopes of the 15 and, and 25 watt uh, uh, TDPs. And so it's really hard to say if Intel is still having some teething problems with 10 nanometer. They say everything's fine, which, you know. Baghdad Bob also said that everything was fine and the American soldiers were impaling themselves in the bayonets of, you know, but anyway. <laughs> uh, yeah, Your it's really though. hard to say. Yeah, thanks. Uh, but it's, you know, I, obviously their 10 nanometer has improved from what they released, what, a little bit last year. Uh, was that Whiskey Lake? I can't remember. Yeah, Whiskey Lake. Is Whiskey the Lake or something, I think. But uh, oh, it was with you, like there's too many code names and there's too many lakes and it just they they all. Well, there was one that actually stuck in my world. memory. Yeah, I don't know why. Well, crazy, but yeah, it's. Uh, gosh, I wish I had a 
better grasp of of where we're at. We've only seen these products. We've only seen their their clock speeds. Um, their performance is apparently quite impressive for what they do achieve. Uh, graphics performance has taken a big jump forward with oh, Intel. Yeah. And so all those things are integrated in there. And it's also uh, uh, the the I.O. Is, is all in there as well. And they've included Thunderbolt 3, um, Wi-Fi 6, all of this kind of stuff that, you know, it, it's going to eat up power to be able to, you know, actually work. And so being able to hit 15, 25 watts with the performance and the clock speed they they have, I don't think it it's it's not bad. I think that it's going to be a solid performing part, and I think 10 nanometers is, is probably going to be fine from here on out. Um, we really won't get a better idea until we start seeing desktop processors at the full 65 to 95 to 103 watts, whatever they decide to uh, to set that out. And then we'll see really how, how well that scales in terms of performance, um, and 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 thermals and and power draw then we can finally get in a good idea where, where 10 nanometer is and how it compares to tsmc's now pretty mature seven nanometer and uh what very soon they're going to start um if they haven't already they're they're seven nanometer plus i think that uh products are are starting to be uh, uh put through that new process here shortly if not already i think they'll fall but anyway um but yeah these ice uh, ice lake doesn't look bad for what it is and their configurable tdp is is pretty cool as well i know that that uh, some laptops seem to uh um support that so that's pretty pretty nice stuff that's yeah. all I mean, that's yeah all if I it's got the say. thermal if it, if it if it can handle the thermals and run at that higher, like 25 watt mode, then yeah, for sure you're going to be getting longer sustained, higher frequency boost clocks. I'm most excited about this from a graphics perspective. And we've seen some of the early numbers. I know Tom's Hardware and on tech, legit reviews, they've all posted benchmarks. I think legit reviews and Tom's had more gaming benchmarks to show, but it's pretty good for uh, a one megahertz processor. Yeah. <laughs> That's... Somebody kind of messed up on the, the chart they gave to PR. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> hey, well, is there any megahertz in there? Yeah, I see that. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Hey, at least the chart that I made doesn't say megahertz or does it? I blame Ken. You know, there's no quality control there. What is going on with That's their true. technical PR stuff, people? Uh, but yeah, I mean, we've seen 64 execution units before we've seen one 1.1 gigahertz clock speeds before from intel graphics it's, they didn't change that it's not like they're just throwing more speed or eus at it they have a significantly faster graphics architecture that looks really General really 11. impressive so far yeah and it's yeah. coupled with really fast memory they have memory of what was it 3733 i think is the lpddr4x yeah. stuff which is obviously it was very great. impressive throughput yeah, and which is what you want with integrated graphics. We've seen how APU scaling works, and you cannot throw fast enough memory at an APU. And this could turn laptops like this one, where you, you choose a thin and light, and it by definition, if you want battery life, you're probably going to end up using a laptop that doesn't have a discrete GPU. Because as, as enthusiasts and gamers, we think discrete GPU is better, but you actually use one in practice if you're mostly working on a laptop. If it has to use that discrete GPU, I know there's a lot of graphic switching and stuff out there for conserving power, but it just ends up being more of a detriment because you don't really want to game on batteries. And if you have a work laptop, you just want to get work done. You want the longest battery life possible. And with higher, and higher frank, screen you resolutions, haul, you got to haul the GPU and the cooling around. Yes. Yeah. Really thin. Profile laptops, they're just not well suited. And I know that there's the max Q stuff and there's there's ways of getting the TDPs down, but it's at reduced performance levels and there's always that extra thermal burden. So for thin and lights, which is what this launch is repeatedly in the in the press release, they're stressing this is for thin and light laptops and two in ones. So for those types of machines, it makes a lot of sense to have fast built in graphics, throw some fast memory on the board. It's gonna be soldered memory if you're getting that really fast stuff. So 
you know, no SODEMs for the 3733, but, you know, this uh, that's kind of par for the course with a lot of these really thin laptops anyway. They're kind of disposable. You're supposed to use them for a year or two. Now, Jeremy, one of the things I was going to ask you about, 10th generation, this is, it's going to have all the mitigations built into it. They're going to be baked in. Does that make you feel better if you're like deploying new laptops? Would you specifically wait for 10th gen? Are you telling people to wait for Ice Lake at this point? Or are you comfortable yes, with just running? Because there's been no new vulnerabilities released since the last time they broke out. <laughs> and we still haven't patched a lot of the damn Dell stuff. Uh, in a way, yes. Uh, but unfortunately, in, in practice... It's a financial decision, and they update when the the bill comes due, and they've got to re-sign uh, another contract. Uh, and this leads to all sorts of fun things, like say, you know, if you hold out for literally three weeks, the next two years you will be protected from a whole bunch of these things. Uh, if you would just not buy that NV uh, the NV three fifteen that Adobe failed support on and just, you know, bought something a little bit better that Adobe still could use for hardware acceleration. But no, uh, it's not really a corporate decision or it's not in the corporate decision-making process, which is a pathetic. If on the other hand, you're looking at buying a laptop or you're working for a small company, you've got big input in it. What a yes, hold out, hold out this. It's, it's foolish not to, uh, and you're, you're going to be having a lot of more happy people because yeah, you're not going to be playing, uh, the, uh, some of the benchmarks I saw were like uh, total war three kingdoms. You're not going to be playing that very well. Uh, Josh, you'd be more than happy with world of warships on one of these things because the graphics literally, uh, at the 15 watt level, their average frame rate beat, the maximum frame rate of the Wissy Lake generation uh, at the 25 watt power profile, which I, I honestly don't think many people are going to sell things at the 15 watt by default. I think we're going to see a huge amount coming out of the 25 watt. Uh, the minimum frame rate beats the maximum frame rate on the previous generation. It's it's not something we're used to seeing. We're used to seeing you know five or seven percent jump from uh, generation to generation on anything. And I'm very sad that I can't make fun of Intel's ing integrated graphics anymore because they are <laughs> now respectable. But for uh, the new office applications and that, which are, for the most part, GPU accelerated, unless you go to your way to disable them, your users are going to be a lot happier. And frankly, you're going to be a lot happier. Browsing the web, doing whatever it is that you're doing, it's it's finally a bloody compelling reason to actually do a refresh on, on your laptop uh, fleet. I, at least as far as we've seen, because as you mentioned, it's the second almost release, but they still haven't quite come out onto the market yet. The official word is, if I can find the quote, the processors codenamed Ice Lake are the first to debut in the 10th gen Intel Core processor family and will be available in new designs from PC manufacturers for the holiday season. Mm. So we're not going to see these until, it sounds like, closer to the end of November, December sometime. So maybe they'll have them in only time for Black would, Friday shoppers. If only people would go back to sideband memory with these graphics chips integrated stuff mm. you know 512 meg chip it's probably going to be pretty quick and mm -hmm. of course i think that's just kind of a driver nightmare to try to get all that work together and i don't know but yeah Didn't i just remember highest... my first what eight seven eight sixty g excuse me chipset from uh from amd it, it supported up to like the old igp a sideband yeah mm -hmm. Yeah, sounds about right. But what were you going to say, uh, Sebastian? I was just thinking that some of the Iris Pro I thought used to have their own dedicated they had fast e -dram. memory. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, they they were they had eDRAM in there. You know, fifty seven seventy five, mm -hmm. fifty seven seventy K, something like that. Those were rare. Yeah. Some all in ones I think might have had those, but oh, yep, not many at all. Iris Pro. And let's let's briefly before we move on talk about the new. 
processor naming structure. Have you seen their little decoder to let you understand? It actually kind of makes sense when you look at it, but yeah. it's almost like you're looking at a, a string and trying to figure out what the CPU is. Like if I was following one of those serial leakers on Twitter where they're constantly looking at these ID strings, it's brand, so in this case, Intel Core, followed by brand modifier, so i7, then gen indicator, in this case, 10, then the skew numeric digits, in this case, 65, followed by level of graphics, which is, of course, G1, G4, and G7, because, of course, not 1, 2, 3, not ABC, and then processor. So, the you know, the i7 1065 G7. And then you instantly know, oh, it's 10th gen, it's SKU number 65, and it has the highest level of graphics performance with the G7 modifier, or whatever what you want. But is it a Y or a U? Uh, you know what? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, <laughs> why didn't they put that in the product name? You, you wonder. Let me see. Let me scroll. Uh, I didn't even think about that when I was making this chart. Yeah, there's no there's no differentiator between I, for between Y and, and U, is there? I guess you just have to know. Like, well, if you're talking about a 1060 yes. G7, that's why. But if you're talking about a 1065 G7, that's you. That's totally different. Yeah. Yeah, totally. I mean, that, that five indicates that it is a... Okay. I, instantly, I, I no longer agree with this. They've got to throw the U I, on I there. mean, I get it, but... Their chief performance but, strategist needs needs some... Uh, yeah. Yeah. We'll, we'll talk to him. Or his intern. One of the two. Yeah. yeah. yeah they, they really messed out. Uh, as Josh, Kurt Vonnegut, and I know, if the Ice series had come out as the ninth generation, it would have spread everywhere. There would have been no Ice stopping nine, it yeah. whatsoever. Yeah. But they missed. Uh, yeah, I think Vanilla Ice Lake, Ice Lake, Ice Lake ice Baby. Baby. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I'm glad of, there wasn't uh, a T series or it just would have written itself. You know, uh, this week we have a uh, sponsor for our podcast, and Jim would love to tell you about it. So with this clever segue, take it away, Jim. Our sponsor this week is Captera, the leading free online resource to help you find the best software solution for your business. Now, if you have a business or you're responsible for the software in your business, there's pretty much no business out there that doesn't need or at least can't benefit from having good software. But how do you find the software that you need? How do you know what's going to work, what do you, what's going to help your business run better, what's going to make your employees happier, make your customers happier. How do you find it? And the solution, the answer is Captera. You can search through more than 700 specific categories of software, everything from project management to email marketing to yoga studio management software. And no matter what kind of software your business needs, Captera makes it easy to discover the right solution fast. For example, we used Captera here at PC Per to find a new link shortening service. We went to Captera, looked through the list of uh, URL shortening software. There were many different entries. We were able to browse through the different options, see the reviews from real users of these products and services, and pick the right one. And the best part of all was that it was completely free to, for us to use. No sign up, no payment, nothing. Just go to captera.com slash PC Per and start browsing to find the right software for you. That's C-A-P-T-E-R-R-A dot com slash PC per. Captera, software selection simplified. Uh, we're back uh, from our short ad break. Thank you, Jim. One of the things I found fascinating over the last couple of days is that Tech Power Up, and if you're familiar with them, you know that they're the ones who produced this handy GPU Z tool. And so they're going through and organizing a new update. And lo and behold, they discover that for both the RTX 2060 Super and the 2070 Super, there are no fewer than three distinct hardware IDs for each of these cards. Does this surprise either of you that, you know, these are cards that are based on the same GPU as their bigger brethren? and then just are differently configured and are hitting a different price point. But well, the yeah, it may different. Well, yeah, there's a sticker on it. So do yeah, you think I bet this they is have like... to, I bet they have to get those back. I mean, cause you're, you're talking about that. They're, they're using the same boards. They're just adjusting them and, yes. and somehow coming back with, you know, more memory, you know, like the 2060 super, it'd be hard to do. Cause 
you don't have eight gigs of memory on these older cards, but the 2070 and and whatnot that you can start swapping things around. I mean, you probably just right. go onto the GPU and add another resistor or take one off or something. Yeah. And uh, you you de de defused <laughs> the uh, the GPU, and so it it you know it has more. But I mean, you're gonna, gonna have to do some serious you know BIOS flashing, and I mean it's well, yeah. probably not simple, but it's at the same time much cheaper than producing an entirely new card and then I don't know selling the old one for much less. Well, here's the thing. They they would if this was true, they would actually be selling the more expensive card for less because they would be taking a 2070 that would otherwise just be sitting around with the 2060 Super basically at the same level of performance. They may or may not be BIOS flashing it or might be doing something with a resistor like you'd mentioned, and then it goes back into the wild as a 2060 Super, which they would then sell for $100 less. So if this is being done, the tech power up speculates there might be some sort of a rebate being extended to them on their future GPU purchases from NVIDIA. If this is NVIDIA authorized, they said, we're not sure exactly how the board modification is performed, whether solder rework and BIOS flash are done at the AIC factories or whether NVIDIA does it in-house to protect their methods. So they had talked about different possibilities and whether or not this is something that is kind of a program that NVIDIA might have for their add-in partners. But I... I had initially thought when this when these cards launched because 2060 and 2070 Super are a huge leap forward. They're almost in the in the case of the 2060, you literally are getting 2070 level performance. Yeah. And with the 2070 Super, you're within about 10%. You're you're getting into single digits at times. So why would you buy a 2070 at this point when you could buy a 2060 Super for a hundred dollars less and get the same performance? So instead of seeing huge price drops. Maybe this is the strategy, like just, you know, slowly and silently those cards will disappear as they become 2060 supers and the 2080s become 2070 supers. It's invasion of the GPU snatchers. <sighs> it's it's weird. And it's it's weird because they kept prices on the supers the same as like the 2070 super stayed at the same price as the 2070 and the 2080 super is the same price as the 2080. But with that one, you're not really getting that much more. You're getting a cheaper Founders Edition card. But I don't know. I, I would love it if we found out that the 2070 Supers out there are really just 2080s with a BIOS flash that people can flash them and get 10% higher performance. But even that, would I'd be skeptical. I, I mean, I would not want to risk bricking my 2070 Super and just to try to get 8 to 10% higher performance. But anyway. Ever since the, the Bitcoining craze uh and the price of gpus i am not confident that people in both companies looked and said you know what we could be selling gpus for a lot more than we used to and all of a sudden the coin may apart from a certain uh ex antivirus uh creator uh the coin craze is kind of teetered off so now they're sort of left in a lurch where they're staring at a market where it's not easy to figure out what price to launch something at. It's not easy to figure out what price people are going to pay for it. Whereas before we were looking at a long standing trend and you knew that if you slapped an extra 10 or 15% on, you could charge an extra 25, 30% because people would do it. Uh, Titan being the outlier. Uh, but now it's a, it, it is a wide open market. We are seeing GPU prices at launch significantly higher than we ever have previously. Uh, and at the same time, you're you're watching them sort of backtrack and saying, well, geez. Uh, and again, we, we don't know the financials. Uh, NVIDIA is tomorrow? No. 15th. Yeah. So is 15th. It? Oh. Yeah, I just saw the email uh, come out yeah, that they're going to do was... it. So we don't know the financials at all, and we don't know the public financials, but I, I can't help but wonder if there's some reorganization going on in the background that they're trying to figure out you, what will people pay for a GPU? Uh, what What is our market looking like? Because it went significantly wild there for a while. And they were still kind of riding that wave when RTX came out, right? Because the... Those cards were launched at six ninety nine when you couldn't really buy a Pascal card 
for MSRP. But that also made sense because you couldn't buy a cart. So that was, that was after at the all. crash. Yeah. That was that was, was after, after the, the crash? crash. That was what October. Oh, yeah. RTX no, it was it was it was like May June where they started to see holes. In July, the bottom fell out. Okay. Yeah. And they released those in, uh, yeah, September, I think. October. Yeah, SIGGRAPH was when they announced, and then, yeah, it yeah. took a while to, for them to come out. It, it's just a weird market right now, uh, and I don't I don't envy anyone trying to price GPUs in the long term at either NVIDIA or AMD right now. Yeah, I'm, I'm liking the $400 and less market right now a lot yeah. more. Yeah. I just, I, it's just ignore the high end. Seven hundred dollars is ridiculous. You can buy a, <clears throat> you can build a really capable system for seven hundred dollars. So just get yourself a nice three four hundred dollar GPU and put it in your existing system, and you know it. Yeah. You'd be a lot happier than if you blew all that money on a GPU, especially if prices drop. And I don't know if that's kind of where you were going with that, or if you think maybe by the end of the year we might see reasonable gpu prices again has amd well i think that's asking a little much but if amd comes out with what's gonna happen with big navi and lisa sue i know was talking again somebody was quoting her talking about how it's it's on track and they're working on it if big navi comes out whatever that is the 5800 or 5900 series and it's priced competitively enough and they have shown a tendency to want to, I mean, they initially announced pricing differently. Of mm-hmm. course, we all know the whole, what is it? Jebated nonsense on social media from mm-hmm. certain uh, PR people with the company. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, whatever that was all about, they did release at 399 for a very capable card, whether you like blower coolers or not. And there's new designs coming from everybody. I'm sure soon enough, but mm-hmm. 5700 XT is really fast for 499. And it's, in fact, it's within about 5% of a Radeon 7. So that makes that card at $700 seem absolutely ridiculous, unless you are strictly buying it as a content creator and you have a specific need for that much high bandwidth memory for that architecture. Because you're you're getting something that is going to be powering the Mac Pro, like the, the Vega 2 is in the Mac Pro. Right. So that's the consumer version of that. It's like a Hackintosh dream card, I guess, if there are texts for it yet. But uh, anyhow, we were talking about BIOS flashing and cards, and it turned into a whole discussion about pricing, which has been a very sore subject for over a year now. I mean, it has. High end cards at 500 was controversial, high end cards at 700 are, is laughable. Yeah. And just bloody predatory that, pricing. Yeah. The, oh, the, nice the, transition what, there. The, the GTX 1060 6 gig was slightly under 400 bucks for the longest time. How awful was that? Yeah, because it that launched at 249 or no 299. I think 299. The, yeah, because the the yeah, I think so. three gigabyte variant variant was only I think was 249, which was already an increase yeah, over the 960, which was 199. That's right. So it had been creeping up. The 900 series. To the 10 series, there was a, a price increase pretty much across the board, though we still had that $500 card, which I think has been a constant for quite a while now. I want to say the 580 was $500, the 480 was $500, or was it only $400? I know the 680 was 500 The 480 was, it was 450 to 499 Okay. And then the 580 well, was the same, away. except... Yeah, that was that was a long time ago, and then the what the six eighty was the same four ninety nine. Yeah. yeah, and then the uh, the nine eighty though that that jumped up in price a bit. Yes, and then the ten eighty was not quite seven, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Ten eighty founders edition I think was five ninety nine, and the the stock one, the those generic blower designs were four ninety nine. But now they were anyway. Always, they were. 600 bucks pretty much always oh, yeah. 1080s because I got uh, 1070 after launch. And it was a $479, $489 card. Anyway, moving along. Let's let's talk about uh, millisecond response times. How low, how low do you need to go? One millisecond is thrown around a lot. And I think there's a lot of 
probably FUD out there about what the actual response time is because it's gray to gray, but that's sometimes just one shade of gray to another shade of gray. But regardless, I don't think I've seen sub one half millisecond response times from a monitor before. Jim had posted news of the new Predator XN253QX monitor from Acer, which actually for them, that's a pretty short product name. True. I'm impressed. 25, well, 24 and a half inch, 1080p. So, you know, not super high resolution, but 240 hertz and 0.4 millisecond response time while in overdrive mode. It's TN, of course. It is a G Sync monitor. How much do you think this would cost if you haven't seen the price? Guys, uh, let's take a, a vote. It's 24 and a half inch G Sync, 240 hertz with a sub one half millisecond response time. 499. 500. Looking at... <laughs> You're both correct. Four ninety nine ninety nine. <laughs> it's almost like you read the oh, article. That was, that was actually, no, I, I did it's... not actually read the article. I, I did when he first posted it. I'm like, are you uh, f- shitting me? Yeah, no, with, uh, with uh, that speed, the form factor, and having G-Sync, it's, it's going to be pricey. Speaking of form factor, I don't know if uh, we can see the side shot of this thing. This might be Ugly. the chunkiest monitor I've seen in a while. You're approaching compact CRT depth there between the stand and that panel. It's pretty impressive. But I mean, you need it for all the overdrive. Yeah, that looks kind of gross. That's weird. It's- Is it actively cooled? That I don't remember from Ooh. Is it curved? I'm not sure. I didn't see. I don't no, think so. No, it's not. No. Not at 24 and wow. a half inches, no. It's yeah, just no, an expensive 24 and a half inch monitor with G-Sync. Yeah. I would like to see yes, it in person but, to see what kind of a TN experience that is. I don't do anything at less than half a millisecond. No, but you would... You Honestly, would I don't do anything so at less better. than half a second. Listen... Jeremy, you'd be so much better at Fortnite with 0.4 millisecond response times. Yeah. You could I could have won that three mil. Speaking of game development and other things, SIGGRAPH uh, was this last week, and one of the things that was announced was, on the graphics front, RTX support coming to Blender. So finally, another purpose for an RTX card. Those RT cores can be put to work. Rendering. It's going to be optimized for. Actually, cards. the... I think since this was published, this was only a few days ago, the 29th, Scott posted this. Wasn't version 2.80 of Blender officially released? I know it's been in beta for a while, but the new version of Blender is out. So just another, hey, you know, if you've got one of these cards, apparently they, uh, it was a patch created by Patrick Moores of NVIDIA in close collaboration with the Blender Institute. Currently, it adds OptiX as a new API to cycles for RTX ray tracing. Mm. But they also expect to add AI denoising in the future. So this maybe some more ones are in coming up. Room. Hmm. Sorry. I really should Speaking. <laughs> speaking of, uh, well, not necessarily just RTX, but GeForce and Titan cards in general, a very professional level option for certain like professional applications such as Adobe applications like Photoshop, etc. You always had to go out and buy the professional card if you wanted to enable full 30-bit support. If you had a 10-bit panel, you had a Quadro card, you were using the latest version of Lightroom or you know Photoshop, you could enable 30-bit color. And of course, I say that, I'm not sure if Lightroom supports 30-bit. It probably does. But otherwise, you're limited to 24-bit. And there is a very exaggerated example of the difference between 24 and 30-bit which is was created simply to show you on any monitor what uh, banding looks like, but in reality, I don't see it's, any difference. Yeah, I mean, looking at my uh, sixteen color display here, they look identical. Mm-hmm. But if you have the supported hardware, and now you don't even have to have a professional level graphics card, it's another one of those things they've brought to the studio drivers, which are kind of the quasi-professional drivers that are tuned for application performance rather than gaming. So you can buy a GeForce card or take an existing one. 
install the studio driver instead of the game ready driver. And then this gets unlocked. So I think it's Windows only too. Not that you'd be running NVIDIA on a Mac. Of course, that doesn't really make any sense. But uh, I think it's just on Windows that in, that uh, Adobe applications offer this currently. So another reason to not be on a Mac, I guess, if you're a creative. So maybe things are swinging back into the favor of a low-cost workstation versus an expensive Mac Pro. Speaking of Apple, actually, perfect segue. Because I don't know if you can remember, a short time ago, Apple chucked Intel. They kicked them out. They, they, you know, unmercifully broke off their little partnership they had going when they were still sticking it to Qualcomm and refusing to pay Qualcomm for any chips and buying Intel's chips. And then there were the... The rumors swirling around about Intel LTE modem performance maybe not being quite as good as Qualcomm. So then they were downclocking them or, or reducing their performance artificially so that the Qualcomm chips did not outperform the Intel chips. And Qualcomm was not very happy about this and thought it was misrepresenting their products. And they had this protracted legal battle, of course, which you know about if you've been following the industry at all in the last year. And then one day, out of the blue, Intel settles. And they pay a whole bunch of money to Qualcomm. And they they pay Qualcomm their asking price pretty much for these new chips. And they're going to be using Qualcomm going forward. And within 24 hours of this, might have even been the same day, Intel comes out. They release a press release, uh, a statement that says they're exiting the phone business entirely. The modem business, they're just, it's done. Apple was their only customer. Apple went back to Qualcomm. Intel was shutting it down. So what happens but on july 28 intel smartphone modem business sold to apple for a billion dollars so apple comes right back in and just buys it so some of the speculation that they didn't have a working product if you read semi-accurate charlie had some pretty scathing commentary about the fact that intel basically was stringing apple along and did not have the silicon to back up their claims about having a working 5G modem for Apple in any kind of reasonable time frame. Well, apparently Apple thinks they have enough to want to buy up not only their patents, but the whole, pretty much the whole division and thousands, uh, 2,200 employees from Intel. They're just assuming all of it. What do you think about this? It's kind of crazy because they don't have a great track record. I mean, but, you know, building modems is hard. We've, we've known this for a long time. NVIDIA tried to do it with Icera. They failed pretty miserably and uh, just wrote that whole thing off. Um, other people have tried to do modems, and it's just it's just a technology that is really hard to do well. And, you know, Intel's got a lot of good people. They've, they've worked hard to go from zero to what they have now in, in a relatively short period of time. They're not at Qualcomm levels, obviously, but you know they're getting there, and Apple is going to infuse more money into it, and they're going to hire more people, and they want to they want to go vertical so bad they can they can taste it. I mean, they did that with their 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 SOCs, and now they're they're doing it with their modems. And uh, you know, I think Apple just they don't want to be at the uh, the mercy of of another company if they can help it at all. And so, you know, they've, they've pushed away NVIDIA because of, uh, you know, differences in, in philosophies there. And uh, now they're, they're doing the same with, with Qualcomm. They're trying to get out from underneath that. They want to probably push the industry where they want to go. And, you know, by doing this, this kind of baseband, broadband, you know, modem type stuff, um, They've got a, a good solution that they can eventually work on three to five years from now where they can maybe push the industry into areas where they really want to go rather than just, you know, kind of going with the flow. It always seems ridiculous saying that a billion dollars is chump change. But, I mean, honestly, uh, considering what the value of the lawsuits that Apple had against Qualcomm, it's it's not even 10% of what they did. It's less than what Intel paid for one chunk of their modem IP uh, back five, six years ago uh, when they were taking over companies that way. And, well, I mean, 
for Intel. I mean, we know that a billion dollars, they just find that in the couch when they were looking for the remote. But it, it's, you know, the bad thing about Apple is like 940 more purchases like that and they'll be flat broke. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're only sitting on like 102 billion dollars in cash. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So. yeah, it's, it's just, just in the spare change jar. So, I honestly I still think that this is going to lead into uh another slew of lawsuits because now they're convinced they don't need Qualcomm. They're they're going to pull 5G out of their uh, core somehow out of this purchase. And yeah, I, I just wouldn't be surprised to see a resumption of the, the wonderful legal soap opera that we've all been enjoying for almost a decade now. Speaking of things we've been enjoying for a decade or more, Diablo. Jeremy, you posted Come, about uh, sit a while Diablo and listen. Stay a while. In the browser, and look it, well, as we speak, I have loaded this up in my browser. This is the original Diablo. Oh, you went for the shareware one. Well, I, I didn't have Diablo on the system to point to that file, but... I think it costs like two bucks or something. Yeah. But yeah, I and I actually did get a chance to try it out uh, for a little bit just to prove that it worked because when it launched uh, yesterday, it was... You know, they had a lot of uh, traffic on their site for some reason. I'm not quite sure why. Hmm. But yeah, like th this group... Can you hear it? I Best can't hear you clicking though, so you're probably dying. Soundtrack ever. Yeah. It is a great soundtrack. I enjoy the music a lot. Yeah. But uh, so uh, a group or a person, we I'm not sure myself, named Galaxy Hacks, literally I, like looked at the original source code and reconstructed it to the point where they've posted the entire freaking engine and everything on the web. If you want to do the shareware version, it loads a 50 meg file. And the next bloody thing you know, you are playing the original Diablo, which when it was first released was just an amazing accomplishment. It was like, wow, this is one of the best video games ever. It's going to spawn the, you know, five, six sequels easily. And they've set it up so that uh, you can happily play the single player or if you own the actual game, which is available on good old games and on uh, Steam, you can drag that uh, MPQ file into the web browser and get the entirety of the game. Up to, and I believe, including the cow level and the bugs, if you want to go and replicate yourself some gold just off to the side there. Uh, it, this is amazing. I, yeah, it's taken a long time for them to do this, but it's just amazing that... We've gone from addicting games and uh, silly flash games to, yeah, let's just load Diablo on my computer through the browser and just play it. And it supports local saves too. So you can load it up. It did eventually crash on me, uh, probably because I had to go do some stuff and it just sat there idle. It's, it's lovely. And I love the fact that Blizzard was nice enough to say, you know what? It's at the point where it's shareware. We released the demo, uh, which is essentially what the shareware version is. But just go out there, do it, and we're not going to sue you. Right, Blizzard? You're not going to shut this down because this is just amazing. And maybe, you know, you know one if, day, you know, release the fourth one. Yeah. If Chrome is going to take all my RAM off. anyway, I might as well get something <laughs> yeah. out of it. <laughs> And actually, it's I only am, am at five point three out of sixteen gigabytes <clears> used <throat> currently. With uh, you know, I have nine tabs open and nothing else running on this computer. And literally, I had no idea why games. why Diablo even came on a CD because it was such a small yeah. game. It's tiny. Yeah, because yeah, CDs were hot. Well, back what else then. could they put it? Yeah, multiple floppies. Well, you had what a one point two gigabyte hard drive, and so that was a significant amount of uh, space that. Diablo yeah. had to. Well, and this was plus, back actually was... when you could go to Hastings and rent, rent PC games. Yeah. Wow. Hmm. Well, that means something different in Vancouver. 
Uh, I'm, I'm trying to vaguely remember how much RAM my system would have had back then. 128 I was on megs. megs. Oh, yeah, 128? My family yeah, computer when I was a kid was an AMD K62 with 64 megs of RAM and a 6 gigabyte Quantum Fireball hard drive. Ooh. So that was loud. It was a loud hard drive even by those mm-hmm. standards. Oh, it, it was named well. Yes. Uh, let's move on to picks of the week before we wrap this up. Jeremy, you're first. Oh, this is in, this is interesting. Yeah, so I don't know how I ended up on the Drone Shield mailing list, but there is no way you're ever going to get me off of this. This is uh, a company which specializes in getting rid of drones in places you don't want them. Uh, as anyone who's played around with uh, the, the UAVs or drones, essentially as soon as it loses the signal from the base, it will set itself down very quickly. So these guys have produced it in a form factor familiar to many people. Uh, (laughs) They go from the Drogon Mark III, which is the one you're currently looking at here, which will not only convince the drone to land, but will block any video whatsoever that's coming out of that drone at the same time, to automatic, uh, well, I mean, essentially turrets that will take down drones. The Drone Gun Tactical is their BFG and is utterly freaking gorgeous. Wow. <laughs> yeah, it's got a bit more range on it, but it weighs a bit more too. Uh, there, there are certain reasons why you do not want drones around. Uh, personally, I would love to see these uh, given out to law enforcement agencies and firefighters because in BC, we do tend to have forest fires, and the second that you've got a friggin' drone out there from some idiot stick that wants to take pictures of it, all the water bombers are getting out of the area because if that goes through your windshield, you're not going to be happy, and neither is your family. So it, it, it does make sense. It's a, a, arguably a bit of a dick move to do to some cases, but... It's good to know that this is available for those that do need it. And whoever does their designs is, yeah, has a really good idea. They also have, and hey, you're not, you're not smashing it. It's humane. No, it just sits down, setting it down quietly. And then you set off the explosives on it, but you know, you know, well, yeah, it's a different thing. Stomp on it. Every kid running over with a bike, you know. Yeah. Uh, you know what? Storage is, is always uh, something fun. And, uh, you know, it still amazes me. You can get 128 gigs of flash memory and a stick for 20 bucks. 300 megabyte oh, per nice. second reads, less writes, obviously. But yeah, 20, 21 bucks. And it's a solid build. You can throw that thing around. You can probably wash it as long as you dry it out. It's going to be great. And it looks sharp. Feels good in your hand. Mm. It's fast. It's dense. And only twenty one dollars. That just that boggles the mind. As that somebody who uses a lot too. of thumb drives, look at that design. If you look at it from the side, that uh, sort of curvature to it, it looks like it would be really easy to pull out of the USB. It, port. it is. It's really nice. It's ergonomic. You can install but an it, OS it, on it, that thing. Yeah. yeah. But it's also big enough that people will f- won't forget it's stuck in there and destroy their USB ports as they shove it in the bag. Yes. Yeah. Awesome. I'm going to have to order one of these. $21.99. Sale ends in three hours. Oh, okay, oh, if you're watching oh, this, I'm sorry, guys. But it's cheap anywhere. Yeah. Oh, I see. There's, it's on sale for $21.99. There's also a promo code right now, so it's even cheaper. And you, you yeah. can't have it as you listen to this pre-recorded. You can't have this offer. I'm sorry. It'll be back. There'll be another offer. Yeah. Uh, I picked something really inexpensive that I think is going to improve my life greatly. Uh, I am rather obsessive about the cleanliness of my builds. And for some reason, I've never had cable combs. Even though I have these nice braided, like individually sleeved uh, power supply cable extenders that I use for different build photos. But finally, I'm going to put up some... uh, put some combs in these things and there's some really yeah. cheap ones on Amazon five bucks with free prime shipping. So I ordered them up. They'll be here tomorrow. And, uh, my life will never be the same as I put together this massive water cooling 
thing that's been behind me this entire mm-hmm. podcast. Corsair was nice enough to sample us with their Hydro X system, which is literally just individual components. And I have never built a custom loop before, so it's rather terrifying. So I need to get about 20 rolls of paper towels and uh, lay it all out on the table and figure out what I'm doing. But I will at least have cable combs on the PSU cables when I have my finished build. So, any of you have any other thoughts before we close this thing down for the week? Just why do they it's look like the week. world's worst capos? With the cable combs? Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's true. It just, yeah, rather ineffective. It caught, uh, you know, the musicality of string buzz is debatable. Uh, so, anyhow, if you enjoyed this, definitely uh, subscribe. Like and subscribe, mash that button down there. But uh, until next week, goodbye.